Hey everyone, welcome to Bathrooms and Bunkers, powered by Lean Solutions Group. The Bathrooms and Bunkers podcast is dedicated to telling stories of excellence from incredible people around the globe. Today we're in Liberty, Missouri, just outside of Kansas City, on the campus of William Jewell College. And my guest today, prior to his retirement, joined the ranks of the winningest college basketball coaches in history, former head coach at William Jewell College, and my coach when I played here, Larry Holly. Coach Holly, it's great to have you on the podcast today. Great to be here, good to see you, and uh, glad to have you back on campus. So Coach Holly, we're gonna start with a segment called Once Upon a Time, and would love to hear your story about growing up in a small town in Northwest Missouri and how you got to William Jewell. So tell us a little bit about what that was like growing up. Well, it was uh, a great place to grow up. It was Jamison, Missouri, uh, uh, a great metropolis of 175 people, uh, counting cats and dogs, I think, <laughs> on weekends. But uh, I was uh, born in Bethany, Missouri, about 19 miles north. Uh, my parents were both from large families. My dad was 12th out of 14 children. My mom was 14th out of 16. I'm an only child. <laughs> they decided that that was way too many. Well, <laughs> they took a look at me and said, we're having no more of this. Uh, but, uh, so, but I had lots of, lots of cousins. Uh, and uh, being raised in that small community was, was very special. Um, I went through school there, uh, grades one through 12 at, at Jameson. My dad was superintendent of schools. He was also uh, the basketball coach through my eighth grade year. My mother was the principal of the school and taught. So if I got in trouble at school, I was really in trouble at home. <laughs> but it was a great place to grow up. Um, no more than, never more than 45 kids in the upper four grades, 10 in my graduating class. Uh, it, was, it was a special place. I, don't, I know I didn't realize at the time how, how lucky I had it. When we were walking the campus today, you mentioned that you were valedictorian of that class of 10, so congratulations on that. I was upper 10%. I, I tell people it was in my dad's contract that being superintendent of schools, his son had to be valedictorian, but uh, there was some good competition, and I, I, I did okay, but I uh, was pushed every day by some very good classmates. So in that small town, what activities did you participate in in school? Well, growing up, uh, you know, in that small school, everybody that uh, wanted to be on the basketball team could be on the basketball team, they could get a uniform. Uh, everybody that wanted to be in the band could be in the band. Everybody that wanted to be in the choir could be in the choir. Now you might be asked to sing very softly <laughs> if you couldn't carry a tune, but uh, everybody did everything. There were junior class plays and there were senior class plays. And uh, we started a track program my freshman year in high school. And, uh, but every, everybody was, was totally involved uh, and it was, it was just, a great opportunity. I had great teammates, great classmates. And um, after my eighth grade year, my dad didn't want anybody saying I was playing because I was a coach's son. So he hired uh, Tom McDaniel, uh, an outstanding young coach, and uh, had some really good teams that I played on in high school. I think uh, it became that I was playing because I was a superintendent's son rather than the coach's son. <laughs> but I uh, had a great experience both athletically and music, uh, all areas uh, of that small community. So from Jameson, you, you made your way to William Jewell College in the uh, fall of uh, 1964, 1963, somewhere in there, and uh, played several sports here at William Jewell. Played basketball for four years, did track and field for four years, and I think cross country for four years as well, correct? That is correct. And uh, according to the history, I think I'm the last person to do that on the men's side. I think some women have done that. But uh, my scholarship at William Jewell was basketball track. I was middle distance, distance runner, so cross country lent itself to that, and, and uh, the fall was challenging a bit because when basketball practice started on October 15th, I would quit practicing with the cross country team, but I would practice basketball, then I would just run in the meets. So sometimes my competitive level uh, went, went to the wayside once basketball began. Not that that's a bad way to stay in shape, but it's a lot different from cross country, but I but, uh, never ran out of uh, wind playing basketball got me in good shape, but uh, uh, you know, I, I grew up candidly thinking I would go to Northwest Missouri State University and hopefully would be good enough to play there. But uh, in, my, in the summer before my s senior year in high school, I uh, was approached by a, an individual from William Jewell and then started hearing from William Jewell and, and came for a visit. And the more I looked at it, the more I liked. And, and they would allow me to be in things other than just basketball. Um, as you know, I, obviously I did cross country basketball and track, but also uh, they allowed me to be in concert band and pep band and chapel choir and 
it was a, a busy time, but it was very much like what I had done in high school. Yeah, one of the benefits of a small school for sure, and I, I enjoyed that as well when I was here. We had the distinction of both being cross-country runners and basketball players, so I remember what that was like. But the meets were way more fun than the practice, so you probably had, a, had a, an enjoyable experience once you started basketball practice and ran the meets. Yeah, it was, uh, it was a joy. I wasn't uh, the top runner, but uh, I saw a lot of, lot of runners ahead of me. I, I, got, I had a good view of, of some really good runners in cross-country and, uh, and, and in the middle distance and distance events. Uh, I did some uh, long jump, triple jump my junior, senior year uh, when our top performers graduated and they needed somebody to fill in and get a second, third, or fourth place. They would, they would call on me, but uh, no, it was, it was a great experience. So you graduated here in 1967, and then you became a coach pretty quickly. When did you realize that coaching was what you wanted to do? Well, my dad was a coach, so I was always in the gym as a, as a young, young person with his players, who were my heroes. And I knew from the time that I ever thought about what I wanted to do with my life that I wanted to coach. And candidly, my dad tried to talk me out of it. And I think I was probably about a sophomore, maybe my junior year, that he quit because he knew he wasn't going to talk me out of it. And he didn't want to want me to go into coaching because of all the criticism that coaches uh, get, you know, because every Tuesday and Friday night at the high school level, you're putting your product out there on the line, and everybody's smarter than the coach. If you don't believe it, go sit in the bleachers and, and listen to the fans and the parents and the school administrators. And uh, But the advantages far outweigh the disadvantages. And uh, so I, I knew that that's what I wanted to do. I wanted to be a physical education major, and, uh, and so I, I got to do that. Uh, the year after I uh, graduated at William Jewell, I took a graduate assistantship position at the University of Missouri Columbia uh, in physical education, but it happened to be Norm Stewart's first year as the head basketball coach at the University of Missouri. And of course, he is Mr. Basketball in the state. His two assistants became good friends because they were teaching activity classes as, as I was as a graduate student. I would go to some of Coach Stewart's practices. I'd play noon hour basketball with his assistants. And so it was a great way to get started learning to coach the great game of basketball. So was there anything else that you wanted to do besides coaching? Was there anything or was that really it? That's, that's all you wanted to do? That's all I wanted to do. I, 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 uh, I think my mother would have loved for me to, to have been a music teacher or a minister. I grew up in the Christian church, Disciples of Christ. and and was very active in the church. I would go to summer. I went to summer camp seven times uh, at, 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 in, at Crowder State Park in uh, Trenton, Missouri. And, uh, and then I was very involved in music, went to some music camps. And uh, my minister at, at Jameson at the time had graduated at Culver Stockton College, one of the schools that was, was sponsored somewhat by the, by the church that I attended. And he wanted me to go to Culver Stockton and be a minister. And, uh, but uh, I went to a Baptist school. Uh, who knew? My dad was Baptist. My, my mom and I went to a different church, but uh, it was the right decision, and nobody was going to talk me out of becoming a coach. So you got your start with Norm Stewart at the University of Missouri and then had a stint with a high school. Um, then you coached at Central Methodist. You coached at Northwest Missouri State and then had the opportunity to come back to your alma mater, of William Tool. What was it like getting that call, and what really attracted you to coming back here to coach? Well, you know, I had coached for a number of years. Uh, now, I want to point out I wasn't on Norm's staff, but I went to a lot of his practices and uh, learned a lot from Coach Stewart that one year of graduate school. I then went to Harrisburg, Missouri, and, um, and that was a small high school. And uh, I was the girls' varsity, JV, and junior high coach. I was the boys' varsity, JV, and junior <laughs> high coach. Uh, I did not have an assistant coach. So I'm coaching 16s. I coached 91 games wow. my first year as a coach. We practiced before school, during school, after school, Saturday mornings, and Sunday afternoons. But guess what? I watched my dad do that at Jameson. I watched my high school coach, Tom McDaniel, do that at Jameson. So that wasn't anything new for me. I, bought a, I was single. I bought a 12 by 51 mobile home and parked it, parked it right across the street from the school because I knew I was going to be there <laughs> the whole time. 91 games. At the end of that year, uh, my best friend from my master's program, uh, Frank McKenzie, was also a GA in the phys ed department at the University of Missouri, took all 32 hours side by side, and he had been an all-state player at Chilhowee, Missouri, Class S. I had been an all-state player at Jameson, so we're both from small schools. He played his first two years of college at Mobile Junior College for Cotton Fitzsimmons, 
uh, a noted Hall of Fame coach, and then two years at Central Methodist. So I played against him. I didn't guard him. He was 6'5". He could post me up pretty good. <laughs> but he was in line to be the next head coach at Central Methodist. So he went back after his master's to Fayette, Missouri, as assistant football, assistant basketball, head track coach. The head basketball coach at, Jim Lu uh, at Central Methodist at the time, Jim Luchin, was going to take a sabbatical to do his uh, t uh, uh, living time at the University of Missouri as required for his doctorate degree, and Frank was going to become the head coach. Vietnam was going on. He got drafted in the Vietnam War, recommended me for the job. I'm 15 miles away at Harrisburg, Missouri. I interview interviewed for the job, got the job. And uh, so that's how I got at the college level. I signed a contract at the age of 23. I think I was 24 when I actually started coaching college basketball. Had a couple of guys out of the service who were older than me. My first <laughs> year at Central Methodist. Was there for six years, coached three sports all six years. Football my first two years. That was an experience since our high school didn't even have football. But then started the cross country program. And so that was my fall sport my last four years. Then I uh, had a chance to go to Northwest Missouri State as an assistant coach. Their head coach, Bob Iglehart, had been an All-American at Central Methodist. His wife was from Harrisburg, Missouri, and her family were supporters of me the year I coached there. So it was a natural fit. Two years later, he retires from coaching. I become the head coach at Northwest Missouri State, a dream job for me, and thought I would be there until I got fired or decided to go, go elsewhere. And then two years later, uh, the William Jewell job opens and uh, it was like coming home. So I came back here in the fall of 79, and uh, uh, 42 years later, here I am. I coached for 40 years at, at William Jewell and have been retired for two years. And you've had the thrill of coaching some incredible players, having some incredible teams. So the stretch there from 93 to 97, or 92 to 97, you had four final four teams in the NAIA level. What was that like getting to experience you know, these, these big tournaments, playing or coaching incredible players, and just having a great career here? It was a... Uh, it was, it was a great opportunity. Uh, the first national team I had was the 87-88 team when there was just one division of competition at the NEI level. That was our 32-2 and two team. We got to the quarterfinals of the national tournament. Then we'd go to Division Two, and uh, played in the first national tournament in 91-92. Then, as you said, in 93, 95, 96, and 97, we were blessed to get to the Final Four. Uh, couldn't win the big game. I, I <laughs> think I told you this story, but... After the fourth Final Four in, in a five-year period, the headline in the Liberty paper said, William Jewell loses in Final Four again. Now, the sports writer's a good friend of mine, and uh, I understand, understand that he wasn't being critical, but uh, we just never got to that championship game. But had, had a great run, had a couple more teams and that got to the, got to the national tournament at, at the Division II level and, and, uh, and then three times at the NEI Division I level before we went uh, NCAA. But that... But that five-year run with four Final Fours and spending a week out in Boise, Idaho uh, at the national tournament, it was held on, on campus at Northwest Nazarene in Nampa, Idaho, but uh, that was a lot of fun. Yeah, I remember getting to be a part of one of those teams and enjoying that experience. My first time in Idaho, my first time traveling for basketball, and uh, just an incredible experience to be a part of that. I think that's what made the team so special was we had some really great players. We had Chad Jones that year, previously had Brooke Russell and a lot of other great players but everybody kind of seemed to know their part and we were able to do something much bigger than ourselves as a part of that. And you were the visionary behind all of that. So it was just a tremendous experience. Well, that was a special year, Trey. You were a part of that and uh, special because we had lost four starters and some key reserves off that 96 team, which had a chance to win it all. And to be able to go back with just one returning starter and all the new pieces that fit so well, everybody accepting their role. That, I mean, that's the biggest challenge. Uh, you know, everybody wants more playing time. And if you have a 12-man varsity at the college level, chances are all 12 of those people were starters in high school, many of them the best player on their high school team. And now guess what? Seven of them are adjusting to something maybe they've never done. That's coming off the bench. And uh, so that was a special group because uh, everybody kind of meshed around uh, Chad Jones, who was kind of the leader of the pack and a uh, first-team All-American and player of the year in the conference. But, but Chad couldn't do it by himself. He might have been the leading scorer, leading rebounder, and, and got most of the glory. But you and others uh, played, uh, obviously, uh, outstanding roles to get us there. Well, fortunately, I was never a big scorer in high school, so I didn't try to be a big scorer in college. <laughs> I knew my role was to get Chad the ball 
go back and play defense, and then everything would be good at that point. So and, was, you, and you did it well. It was quite a run for sure. <laughs> uh, it was it was pretty amazing. So you've lived here in Liberty for the last you know, 50 years, roughly 45 years, something like that, 42, something there, somewhere in there. Moved here in the fall of, of 79, so the last 42 years. Yeah, what has this community really meant to you, being, being here and making this home and all the experiences? Well, Liberty was, uh, William Jewell was, was a perfect place for me as a student athlete. Um, you know, it provided me the opportunity to, to express myself in sports and music and I was very involved in fraternity, was president of my fraternity my senior year, which is a great experience, great learning experience for me in a leadership role. But uh, it did, be, did become special. Uh, it had changed a little bit. I'd, I'd been gone for, I guess, 13 years when I came back. Um, I remember when we were trying to decide, uh, my wife and I were trying to decide on whether to stay at Northwest Missouri State or come to, to William Jewell. We, it was a difficult decision because we were very happy and had the best season that Northwest had had in a few years. And, and we had key players coming back. We had a good recruiting class. And all of a sudden now here's William Jewell kind of muddying up the water, making me think about coming back to the alma mater. So we made a list of reasons to stay and reasons to leave. And we had 70, this is absolutely the true story, 76 reasons to either stay or go. And so we have a column that said uh, Northwest Missouri, William Jewell College. And some of these reasons were as important as the school system, uh, hospitals, access to health care. Some as minuscule as, well, Liberty has a McDonald's and Maryville <laughs> does not. You know, so they weren't all equal in, in importance. But here's the absolute truth. There were 76 factors. When we added them up, 38 to stay. 38 to leave. <laughs> and I was working with uh, Dan Lambert, a vice president here at the time, and I was supposed to call him, and I think at 11 o'clock on this particular day and give him a yes or a no. And I called him at, at about 10.30 and I said, can I have another hour? And so for the next hour, I, I left the house and I just walked the neighborhood in Maryville. Actually saw Jim Red, who was the head football coach at Northwest at the time, later would become their athletic director, later would become the athletic director at William Jewell College. So I'm waving at all these people and just walking. I walked in, I hugged my wife, I said, we're going. And my first day back on campus, Dr. David O. Moore was a professor of religion. Uh, and he had, he had been my religion professor. He was also the golf coach at William Jewell, had a team go into our Hall of Fame and won several conference titles. And he looked at me and he said, welcome home. And I get chills thinking about that right now. And, and he was absolutely right. Now that first year, we were 10 and 19. And, and Northwest was winning. In fact, we had to go back to Northwest and play them. And the team I had coached and had recruited all the new players got after us pretty good. But uh, it was the right decision at the right time in my life. Well, I know this community has benefited greatly from having you in it. And um, it's hard to think about Liberty without thinking about you know, Coach Larry Holly. I appreciate That's tremendous. that. tremendous. Now, I, I, in, in research for this interview, I looked up the list of all-time wins among college uh, coaches, men's basketball coaches, and you're currently number nine on that list with, uh, you know, Mike Krzyzewski leading that list at number one, but the names right below you are incredibly impressive. I'm going to read them off. Jim Calhoun, University of Connecticut, Roy Williams, University of Kansas in North Carolina, Bob Knight, University of Indiana and Texas Tech, Bob Huggins, who's still actively coaching, Dean Smith, Cliff Ellis, Adolph Rupp, what does it mean to have your name listed among those titans, those giants in college basketball? Number one, it means I've coached a lot of games. I, I'm not sure my winning percentage is as good as those guys. And, and uh, my, my old saying is, you know, when you coach for 90 years, you should average 10 wins a year in basketball. <laughs> That's it, the formula. It, it means I've been blessed with um, a lot of great players, a lot of outstanding assistant coaches and supportive administrator but perhaps most of all, a supportive family that allowed me to do this. Uh, my wife, Ann, who passed away in 06, and now my wife, Linda, and I, I, I've outkicked my coverage twice, I will tell you that <laughs> right now, but been very blessed. But it's, uh, I look back on it, uh, you know, I have more losses than most college coaches have wins, so I've been on the other side of that coin as well. It can be a humbling experience at times, but, but uh, it, it is, I, I'm just, I've just been very blessed in my life to be around a lot of great people. Yeah, no doubt about it. And speaking of you know, your, your uh, wife, Ann, and now your wife, Linda, we're gonna move into a section called Difference Makers, 
I want to hear a little bit about some of the people that have had a huge impact on your life. Let's just start with your family and you know what that's meant for you and uh, how that's helped you um, achieve success. Well, I'll, I'll start with my mom and dad, obviously, uh, my mentors to me. My, uh, I often say this, my, uh, my dad was my biggest, my biggest critic. My mother was my biggest fan. In fact, during my junior year, sophomore junior year at Williamsville, uh, she was voted fan of the year at Williamsville College, <laughs> and her picture is in the, the Tatler, the yearbook, at Williamsville College as the number one, number one fan at the basketball games. She was not a quiet lady, but she was always supportive, and it was go, 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 fight, 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 win, win, win. Um, but she was, she was uh, a, a small lady, but you could hear her for, for uh, uh, miles around, as they would say. My dad was one that, uh, when they came to a game together to watch me play in college, my dad would never sit with my mother because she cheered all the time. And she was just up standing, and not just for me, she was cheering for everybody. My dad was a student of the game. He wanted to watch the game, and it was very difficult to sit next to my mother and just watch the game. He, he liked to have a little quiet, not, not that the, the people he was around didn't, weren't cheering, but, but uh, he would not sit with her. But uh, uh, so I had amazing, you know, you have no control over who you're born to. I, I couldn't have asked to, for two more caring uh, people. Uh, they were revered in that small, small community of Jameson. I'll get choked up I'm talking about them. And I didn't have brothers or sisters, but uh, as I said, I think I had about 64, 65 first cousins. I think I have over 200 first and second cousins wow. combined. So every Sunday for us was go to church and then go to a family dinner. My mom and dad were from Coffee, Missouri, seven miles north of my home. And so a lot of their sisters and brothers still live there. So we had a family dinner almost every Sunday, which was, which was great. Uh, other mentors in my life, I'll talk about family. Uh, I didn't get married till I was 29. Very blessed to have met uh, Ann Pearl from uh, Mexico, Missouri. We had three lovely daughters. And uh, sadly, she passed away in 06. Uh, two years later, I met and married uh, Linda McLeod, a retired school teacher who was one of your teachers. <laughs> my middle school art teacher. Middle school art <laughs> teacher. World. People thought I needed some culture in my life, so they directed <laughs> me to someone who was majoring in art. But she had been a cheerleader. She was very active in tennis and skiing and volleyball, and, and uh, she loved sports. And uh, so I, I've, I've been very blessed uh, with the two wives, with uh, and Linda's family has, has taken me in, put up with me. Uh, she has two daughters, four granddaughters, and one great-granddaughter. I have three daughters, uh, three granddaughters, and one grandson. So we have a lot to be thankful for. But uh, those people have, have been so supportive of me. Uh, my wife, Ann, uh, I say she raised the kids. I mean, I, I was there in the morning. I was there sometimes. Uh, I would come home after a game and they would already be asleep, but uh, uh, she did a great job uh, with, with our three daughters and now I'm blessed to have Linda in my life and see the amazing job she did with her two daughters as well. Now the coaches circle is a tight knit circle, uh, kind of fraternity of sorts. Which coaches along the way really had a big impact on you and what's some of the best advice that you got from them that helped you in your career? Well, I've, uh, I've actually uh, have a chapter in the book I'm writing on, on coaching advice. Uh, I'll, I'll share a couple of stories with you. When I got my first college job at Central Methodist, I was, I was single and I was working a lot of basketball camps in the summer. And one of my friends from graduate school at Missouri had become the, the head coach at Metro State in Denver. And he started having basketball camps at Estes Park. Hmm, I think that'd be kind of nice spend a week in Estes Park each summer. <laughs> So I started working those camps. Well, one of the coaches, uh, Jim Darden from Colorado School of Mines was working that camp. And he had been a great player at the University of Wyoming. He'd played on the very first uh, uh, Denver NBA team in the late 40s. He had taken a job at uh, Colorado School of Mines and had been there for like 40 years as head basketball and head baseball coach at the same time. So I'm getting acquainted with him and some other coaches uh, and, and so, between sessions, I would go find a phone somewhere. We didn't have cell phones back then. This is in the, in the uh, 70s. And so I would get on the phone and do some rec recruiting. I'd come back to uh, wherever we were staying up at Estes Park, and Coach Darden would look at me, this veteran coach, said, uh, what have you been doing? I said, I've been on the phone. Doing what? I said, I said uh, recruiting, recruiting. I said, really? Well, listen, let me give you some advice. 
if you find a spot that you really, really like, you don't want to win too much. I said, what? What did you just say? He said, if you find a spot that you really, really, really like, you don't want to win too much. Coach, why wouldn't you want to win too much? Because if you start winning too much, they'll start expecting you to win all the time. And then if you don't, you're going to get fired. I thought, well, that's, that's strange advice from a veteran coach. I looked up his record after about 40 years. It's a little bit below 500, but he found the spot. Colorado <laughs> School of Mines. He coached there for 40 years. And everybody loved him, and uh, it was kind of like uh, Missouri Rolla, which is now Missouri S and T. And and uh, you know, a lot of times they were playing against teams with maybe better talent, but but uh, they weren't they weren't getting out coached. But I thought, well, that's a that's a strange bit of advice. You asked about mentors. Obviously, my high school coach was a mentor. My college coach Jim Nelson was a mentor. Those those guys, uh, I learned more about uh, getting people in shape, getting people to play together, believe in a system. Uh, as far as X's and O's goes, uh, uh, I was never an assistant coach. I coached for seven years before I became an assistant. If I had a do-over, I probably would have been an assistant coach for a while. Not that I didn't learn from my high school coach, not that I didn't learn from my college coach, but there were things I didn't learn. Uh, all through high school and college, most of what we did defensively was zone work. We played. Uh, a one-two-two zone we called the plunger in high school all four years. In college, uh, mostly a one-three-one zone, a little bit of man-to-man. -man. We played a two-two-one press, the old UCLA two-two-one press. And so all of a sudden now I'm at Harrisburg High School and I'm having to teach fundamentals and I'm having to teach kids how to shoot layups and how to jump stop and how to pivot You know, at the junior high because I'm the junior high coach. And I knew how to do it and I could certainly demonstrate it, but to break all that down it caused me to really think and become, become a teacher. The first textbook that I used in teaching analysis of coaching basketball at Central Methodist was Practical Modern Basketball by John Wooden. And of course, during this time, he was winning 10 national titles in a 12-year period. Uh, I had gotten to meet him. I got to host him years later when he was retired at Northwest Missouri State. He was on a speaking tour, so I got to host him and his wife for two days in, in Maryville, Missouri. So. Uh, he had a book, and it, it, it had everything detailed. So I used a lot of his principles and a lot of his drills, a lot of his style and putting practice plans together. I'd never written a practice plan. And, and Coach Nelson had a, had a notebook, but he never printed it out for everybody. So I don't know that I really saw what his practice plans were like. And uh, went to a lot of coaching clinics, uh, had a lot of people. I, you know, Bob Knight was certainly an outstanding coach. Uh, you know, defensively, he would, I, I, I'd never played much man-to-man -man defense. I had a lot to learn. And, uh, but just learned through, through clinics and watching other coaches and then being an assistant for two years was a great experience for me. And, and uh, just, just learned, from, I stole everything I've done. I, I, I maybe have invented one thing in my life uh, defensively. So I've, I've basically borrowed from a lot of folks. Well, the best coaches and the best teachers, they say beg, borrow, and steal everything. So you're right up there with them for sure. Now, we've, this segment's called Difference Makers. You've shared some of the people who have made a difference in your life, but you are a difference maker. You've made a difference in so many people's lives, including myself. What gave you the motivation and the energy to just keep pouring into other people for so long? I think I learned that from my dad. You know, um, I say this a lot. Uh, the reason I still enjoy going back to Jameson, there's two big, big events each year. Now, COVID has knocked them out for the last year but there's an alumni banquet where everybody comes back. Obviously, there's never more than 45 in the upper four grades. But I go back to that event, and then they have an event in the fall called the Jameson Picnic. They have a carnival that comes in and have all the rides. And, but I go back to hear people talk about my mom and dad. And so, so the people that have had an influence on me, I mean, it's, it's those folks, uh, my high school coach. It's, uh, uh, and it's just... It's been a process for me to, to watch people, how they deal with others. Uh, Jim Luchin was a great uh, mentor to me, the, the man I replaced at Central Methodist uh, College as a basketball coach. Watching and learning from them. And, you know, I'm, I'm not, uh, I mean, there's, there's players that, that would say very nice things about me. There's players that probably wouldn't. There would be parents. I would sit, when I'm recruiting somebody, I would sit in the office and I said, you know, I could introduce you to some, some parents that would tell you, you want your child to play for Larry Holly. 
Uh, he can define roles. He can X and O it with anybody. Uh, he treats, treats you with respect. All the accolades that you'd want as a coach. I could also introduce you to some parents who would say, never let your child play for Larry Holly. He doesn't know how to establish roles. He doesn't play my son enough. All the criticism that goes with it at times. So I know I haven't been 100% on pleasing people, but I'm very proud of, of uh, the people that I have coached from Harrisburg to Central Methodist to Northwest Missouri State to William Jewell, obviously. Uh, when I retired, I had individuals from each of those schools. I had, I had a basketball player from my first team at Harrisburg that was at my retirement celebration after our last home game against, our last game against Rockhurst. And, uh, and then from Central Methodist, Northwest Missouri, obviously more from, from William Jewell having been here the last 40 years and even some of my teammates. Uh, yes, they're, some of my teammates are still alive, Trey. I know I'm, <laughs> I know I'm, I'm showing my age, but uh, I, I have just, I, I, you know, it, it was a perfect place for me as a student athlete, perfect place for me as a coach, and all the people I learned from. Uh, and I will say this, I learned more from the players than probably the players ever learned from me. And I think most coaches would say that, and that's certainly my case. Well, I certainly appreciate you taking a chance on a skitty kid out of Raytown and giving me a chance to play and learn a lot from you. So my thank pleasure. you for that. My pleasure. All right, so let's transition to the next segment of Secret Sauce. Everyone who's successful has certain things that they do that have become habit that just make them successful. And you know, as a player, you know, under your leadership and, and all the, play, the guys that I played with, we all remember certain things that you used to always say every day, like shirt tails in and strings in, heel toe relationship. How did some of those things really become a part of your philosophy and your you know, commitment to, to teaching those to us? Well, let's talk about shirt tails in. <laughs> in the great game of basketball, when, uh, when you play the game, the lights are on, uh, do shirt tails have to be in? They're supposed to be, yes. Okay, and if they're not, <laughs> what does the referee do? Usually at a, at a dead ball, they'll come and they'll remind you to do it. Yes, That's right. so shirt tails are required to be in in a game, and I always wanted to make practice somewhat game-like and uh, so in later years, when our budget was a little bit better, we could afford to put numbers on our, on our reversibles. I usually had everybody wearing the same number in practice that they, that they used in the games. And, and, and I would put William Jewell on it, you know, pretty much matching the jersey they were going to wear. I wanted our players to get used to seeing Trey Griggs wear number 24 or the next year, 13, at least one whatever. year. <laughs> at least right. one year. And, and uh, so shirt tails are required to be in in a game, so I wanted to, it to be game-like. Um, Heel-toe relationship, uh, I, you know, I, I started using that a lot when we put a matchup defense in. Uh, closeouts was another thing. Uh, players will always say, you always was yelling to close out properly, hands up. We, we started doing that a different way uh, in, in the mid to late 90s. But they're just things I've, I've picked up along the way that were important to me. Um, I'll, I'll tell you a story. Uh, uh, I didn't like to hear bad language. Now, I grew up in a very conservative home. I don't think I ever heard my mother or my father ever say a cuss word. Never heard it. I never heard it from my high school coach. I never heard it from my college coach. And so I was just not around it. And so I had a rule that if I heard a bad word, we were going to stop and get on the baseline and do a down and back. And then if it happened again, we would double it and continue to double it every time I heard a bad word. Well, I won't mention the, the young man's name. He was a, a point guard and a leader on the team. Actually, his name is Kevin Gordon, so I'm going to tell the story on <laughs> Kevin. And he was a leader, a great leader, a uh, very fine high school player out of Mobile in Missouri, and had waited his turn. He had played JV for a while. But it now it's his, his turn to be a leader and be a, be a point guard on the team. Well, one day at, at practice, somebody said a bad word. I blow the whistle. Everybody has to get on the baseline. Now, they have to do down and back in a certain amount of time. Mm -hmm. And if they don't make that time on my stopwatch, they had to do it again. So it wasn't like they just jogged down and jogged back. I believe back. it was nine seconds. They had to sprint yeah. down and back. So, so we continue practice. I don't know, 15 minutes later, another bad word. Baseline. Now it was down and back twice in a certain amount of time. Mm -hmm. Five minutes later, happened a third <laughs> time. Well, now it was down and back four, four times. times. So Kevin comes to me and says, Coach, can I have a moment with the squad? Sure. 
So he takes him out to center court, huddles up, and gets after him. Probably says a bad word while he's getting after him, <laughs> but I didn't hear it. So he said, enough that's not, we're not running anymore. We want to practice. We don't want to run. So watch your mouth. So not three minutes later, Kevin Gordon, the captain, <laughs> says a bad word. <laughs> Eight down and back. <laughs> now, you might wonder why I would, I would be. Now, number one was the way I was raised. I just didn't, never, I never heard bad, bad language. And I, I'm not prissy enough to say that I have never said a bad word, nor did I not hear a bad word while I was in college. But, but I just, the other thing is, as you know, the Maybe Center, our facility, was open. And a lot of times, people are walking the track. And sometimes these are people who are in the Maybe Center for the first time. And I didn't want any of them to have a bad opinion of me or of our players. If a player happens to yell out a bad word, you know, here's a, pe a person walking that, you know, is in the Maybe Center for the first time, and here's Coach Holly, and he has no control over these guys. So that was part. I didn't, I didn't want anybody to have a bad opinion of our players attitudes or talks, uh, you know, while practice was going on. But I, I had, I had some things like, I had, you know, pet peeves or whatever you want to call them. I had, had some things that I'm, I'm sure annoyed the players quite a lot. And uh, I'm okay with that. <laughs> I think the biggest one that annoyed all of us was the two foul rule in the first half, oh, without exception. There's a chapter <laughs> in my book about the, about the two foul rule. Um, uh, I'll, if if you share, I'll I'll give you the shortened version of it if you'd like to hear it. Yes, please. Uh, the, the rule being, and, and a lot of coaches do this. If if a player gets two fouls in the first half of a game, he's going to come out. And in my case, he wasn't going to play again the rest of the first half unless the score started getting out of hand, eight, ten, twelve. I mean, I had a place where I would bring somebody back in. But there were two players in the mid nineties that were always in foul trouble. One was Eric Andrews, our point guard, a very aggressive point guard, and started like 145 games in his career. So I wanted him on the floor, but he was generally not playing 20 minutes in the first half. <laughs> and the other was Chad Jones, who again, uh, a very aggressive post player, uh, who would try to block shots and, and get to the rim, and he wasn't afraid to knock somebody down on the way to the rim. And sometimes he would get two fouls in the first half. So uh, Ann and I go to bed one night and about two in the morning, the phone rings. And, you know, we have three daughters. Now we think we know where they are, uh, but it's, it's scary to get a phone call anytime after you've been asleep for a while. But especially if you have three daughters of, you know, teenagers, that sort of thing. You, you worry about all your kids, but we had three daughters. So the phone rings. And it's, it's, the phone is by Ann's side of the bed, and she answers it, and, and then she hangs up. I, I wake up, and I said, who was that? I said, I don't know. I said, what'd they say? I said, Holly's two foul rule sucks. <laughs> what? Holly's two foul rule sucks. And so immediately, I think of Eric Andrews and Chad Jones. It had to be one of those two. So we had caller ID. So I go into the, the, our main phone, and I find the phone number of the person that just called. So uh, do you want me to call? Ann says, no, I will handle this. So my wife dials the number, and I don't know who was on the other end, but she spared, spared no veracity in her voice. Uh, I don't think she said a bad word during that, that time, but, but she was not happy at being awakened. She was... I don't know if this was a Saturday night or when it was, but we had to get up early the next morning. And, and so, and so uh, uh, she hangs up. Well, now I'm trying, to, I'm trying to find out what really happened. Well, years later, I find out that it was not Chad Jones, it was not Eric Andrews, but it was a friend of Chad Jones's. And uh, that became a real, <laughs> a real joke for them. And there, there is a, a chapter in my book about uh, uh, Holly's two foul rule sucks. I imagine there may have been a, a Kappa Alpha party going on and that came up and... Well, actually it was after hours they had gone over to this uh, fraternity brother's house and uh, they were they were having a soda pop or two and and he he started asking Chad and Bill Dill Dillingham, another KA, uh, for my telephone number and they refused to give it to him because they knew what he was going to do and and every time they'd, there'd be a home game and 
one of his fraternity brothers would get two fouls, and that dead gum coach Holly is taking him out of the game. <laughs> So, anyway. As a bench player, I didn't mind that, <laughs> that rule so much because it meant I might get a little more time. But, Absolutely. Uh, that was a great rule. You've had a chance to win numerous awards. Uh, we had a chance to see that today a little bit at your house, your office, and, and some rings and all those types of things. What are some of the, you know, what's one habit that you developed that you think really led you to that level of success? Something that you just did. You did tell us about the Lamar donut every day on the way to work, but something other than the uh, single donut from Lamar's on the way to work every day. I, th I think, uh, you know, I was asked to. Uh, to speak at a, there was a, a panel discussion among coaches at a coaching clinic. A lot of times at a coaching clinic, you'll get up and make your presentation. And then at the very end, they'll have the panel, all the coaches up there and the audience can ask, ask any of those questions. And they, they asked something, um, an adjective that would describe you that may have, led, may have led to some of your success. And when it got to me, I said flexibility. And what I meant by that is while we recruited players, we didn't get all, we didn't always get every player we wanted for the style that we wanted to play. And so I think my ability to adjust to different teams, different styles of play, uh, and, and try to find uh, an offense that fits them and, and then teach them, teach them the offense and then let them play. As Coach Carricker, our, our 19 year <laughs> assistant, would always say, he would say, just just play, let's, let's play. And and so I, I think if, if there's something that I would look back on that, that uh, helped in any success that I may have had, it would be, in, be able to uh, be flexible enough to change the heel-toe relationship or, or change whatever it was that was we were gonna need to do to have success. Not always successful doing that, but I, I mean, I've had teams without uh, outstanding post players. I've had teams with really good post players. Uh, my last two years of coaching, we pretty much played five out because I had a 6'6 kid and a 6'5 kid who had played point guard growing up. So I essentially had five guys who had played point guard before. And if you're playing against somebody that has never come out of that post area and he's having to come out to the top of the key to guard my 6'6 player who can shoot the three and all of a sudden shot fake and now he's going to the rim because he can put it on the floor and get to the rim, that was a great advantage. But then if you've got certain, certain post players, like when you, when you played, we had Chad Jones, unless we got a shot off the break, he needed to touch the ball almost every possession. And to, not that he was gonna shoot it every time, but he needed to touch it to get people to collapse and then kick it back out to shooters such as you to shot, shoot the, uh, knock down the three. But uh, I, I think if, if, I, if there was something I, consistently did pretty good at it, was making the adjustment to the talent on the team. Did you have any superstitions before every game, something that you always did? And I'll go back to my high school days. <clears throat> uh, my high school days, junior year, we started the year 18 and 0. And we had decided that we weren't gonna walk, wash our socks <laughs> until we lost. <laughs> that didn't last because those socks would just stand up. You know, we, I think we won six or seven in a row, and I mean, it was hard getting them on. Was, <laughs> uh, as, as far as uh, habits, uh, I will tell you this: uh, both of my wives uh, help dress me. If you've watched me, I need help in that regard. But they would always lay my clothes out. They would always lay lay, lay my clothes out on, on road trips, and or if if uh, if one of them wasn't going, they would pack my suit or my travel bag with me and uh that that was always special to me and uh linda picked up on that and and uh made me look uh, at, as good as possible in, in with with this face and body that i have but uh uh you know there were there were uh i suppose there were others i'd have to think about that a little bit but but uh, uh I, I will tell you one other one when we started going to national tournaments in the 90s on a consistent basis, if you will remember, the early rounds, you only had 10 minutes to warm up between games. So we would go out and stay out. So we would do starting lineups and matchups in the locker room before we would go warm up because they're playing eight games a day for the first three days of the tournament. So 32, there's 32 teams there. Half the teams play the first day, the other half play the second day, and then the 16 winners play on the third day, eight games a day. And so at least twice, if you advance to that level, 
you only had 10 minutes to warm up and then maybe it got to 15. Well, I, we got into the habit of we, we did so well doing that and not going back. Typically, you come out and you warm up, you go back to the locker room, you drink water, go to the restroom, do your lineups and then come back out. Well, we started coming out and staying out. You know, maybe it was 20 minutes, maybe it was 22, maybe it was 25. Some guys want to get some extra shots up. So that's something that, that we did. And when we went NCAA, uh, most of the other teams didn't do that. They would come out and warm up when we came out, and then they'd go back in the locker room. And lazy old me, I just, we just stayed out there. So that, that became uh, you know, something that I changed along the way that because of our success at the national tournament, being able to go back and not having enough warm-up time, that we kept that in our repertoire for warm-up. And I do remember a 9 a.m game at the national tournament probably the earliest that i've ever played a game before and some of the practices we had leading up to that where we would come in and eat at 6 a.m or whatever and do go go through all the game preparations and was, actually play the first 10 minutes and we were trying to figure out what what benefited us what caused us to be ready to play it for a, and i think it was actually an 8 30 or an 8 45 game maybe uh it but it, it was we were trying to figure out what was going to be best and what do you have do you have a full breakfast three hours before, you know, or do you just have a banana, an orange, a energy drink, whatever it was. And, and we've, we've played the first game of a national tournament twice, uh, once in Idaho and once down in Branson. And uh, I think we did it the right way because we, we played very well in both those games. Won both of them, that's right. I remember right. pulling that one out for sure. So what is one thing that you would tell your you know, first year coach self? You know, if you could go back and give any advice that you, you know, now have 42 years later, What's one thing you would tell yourself when you first started out? Try not to uh, complicate things too much. Uh, maybe cover too much material before the first game. I was always worried, first game of the year, if I if we had covered because you have this checklist, and you don't you hit, you don't have video, you don't have a scouting report on the team you're about to play unless it's from previous years and previous experience with that coach. So I think I think I. Maybe we weren't quite as ready for some of the things we needed to do because I was trying to prepare for a two-guard front press, a one-guard front press, uh, whether we were running blaster or whatever we were doing with, with our zone presses. Uh, I was trying to I was practicing against a two-guard front zone, a one-guard front zone, a matchup zone. Uh, what if somebody throws a box and one at us? What, 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 you know, I think that early on I tried to be ready for everything. And sometimes you just have to let the players play and, and get all the basics in. Uh, I, I think I was, and I'm sure I was nervous when I first started coaching. And I'm still, I would still get nervous before a game. But, but I think, I mean, when you coach for 51 years, you know, you kind of learn some things and develop some habits. And I, I was the beneficiary of some outstanding assistant coaches. I assure you I learned more from them than they did from me. And if I believed in somebody, as you know, I would I would let them do what I thought they were really good at. And uh, the one year you you played, it was Lee Carricker, and I uh, love that man. And uh, he was the top assistant at Williams Jewel for when I was there for 19 of my 40 years, and uh, still missing. But uh, yeah, let let your assistant coaches uh, be as involved as as you can allow them to do, and still have control yourself. But let them use their skills, uh, but it yeah, it's. I'm sure I had a number, but off the top of my head, those those would be a couple of them. We talked about that earlier before the interview about uh, you're one of the few head coaches that lets their assistant coaches make decisions. And I remember Coach Carricker just you know sending people in and subbing people in all the time. And he was a big guy. He was probably what six 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 seven. No, no, he was probably six three. But six he, three. He, he, but he, he weighed about he weighed about <laughs> he, he, he weighed about two eighty. So he was like a big that. fella. And so yeah. for me, you know, as a freshman uh, point guard, five eight, one hundred you know fifty pounds. If he talked to me, I, I straightened up for sure. <laughs> but uh, some good memories around that for sure. 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 So we're going to uh, transition to a segment called the Quick Ten. These are ten you know, rapid-fire questions you haven't heard you know, before, and so okay. just whatever comes to mind, just the first uh, first thing that you think Am about. Am I getting graded on? Is there a right and a wrong answer? That I, some I, have a right and wrong answer, okay. and, and some don't. I mean, you want to pay attention. <laughs> some of them are really important. First one is who was your first All-American that you coached? My first All-American was uh, Kirk Schauber. Um, 
he uh, had been a great player at North Kansas City High School and signed at the University of Missouri and started uh, five or six games, up, I think, for Missouri as a freshman. He was 6'6", six, six, about 220, 215. Uh, probably the best skill he had was passing. He obviously could score. He could post up. He could play on the perimeter. One of the best uh, passers I ever coached, just uh, really understood the game. His sophomore year uh, at, at Missouri, he, he got a little crossways with Coach Stewart, no criticism of Coach Stewart, no criticism of Kirk. Sometimes it doesn't work. And some family members of the Shavers called me and I thought, well, how do we have a chance to get Kirk Shaver? It's a division one guy. Mm -hmm. And truthfully, he's, he's the guy that kind of, I always say he's the guy that put us on the map. We got everybody's attention. My first year, we were 10 and 19. My second year, uh, he got eligible at semester and we finished 15 and 13. His senior year, we go 22 and eight. We played in three tournaments. He was MVP of two of them. I mean, he was, most of the time, he was the best player on the floor for the year and a half he played for us. And he was named uh, honorable mention All-American I think had he been there during the duration, he probably would have been a first team All-American, but, but he was our first. What, uh, what arena or what gym, what, what college did you enjoy coaching at the most outside of here at Edgewell, like on the road? Oh, that was, uh, that's interesting. Of course, I coached at Northwest Missouri State and I coached at Central Methodist stuff. Um, gosh, very good question. Um, we, had, we had great rivalries. Uh, you know, Mid-America Nazarene, uh, the, during the time that we were uh, in the heart of America Athletic Conference at the Division II level, uh, they were a rival of ours. So anytime we played them, uh, it was going to be a packed house most of the time. And, and though, even though we, we didn't uh, uh, win a high percentage of games at Mid-America, that was, that was a good place to coach. Yeah, it's kind of a, a very intimate environment, very, very tight environment. So it was a good one. All right, how about an easier one? What's your favorite beverage? Well, right now, it, uh, I'm going to answer this. I'm going to say water. Uh, now, I've had, I've had habits in my life. At an early age, Pepsi became the number one drink. Uh, and I will tell you why. I'm growing up in Jameson. My cousin is the head basketball coach uh, in the 50s. I was probably 8, 9, 10 years old. They had a 12, 28-foot camper trailer, he and his wife. They didn't have any kids. They parked it in our backyard in Jameson. Uh, this was my, my dad's, my mother's oldest sister's son. Terrific coach. His wife's father owned the Pepsi-Cola bottling plant in Albany, Missouri. So I, they're in our backyard. I had the run of their 28-foot camper trailer, and they had Pepsi all over that little place. They had it in the fridge. <laughs> they had it underneath the bed. Every nook and cranny of that little, <laughs> little uh, thing that they lived in in our backyard so I was high energy anyway, but you put six or seven of those eight ounce Pepsis in this little <laughs> tiny body, and I'm, I'm bouncing around. So at an early age, Pepsi became, it wasn't Pepsi or it wasn't Coke for me, it was Pepsi because it was free. <laughs> it, was, it was in our backyard. So, so later on, I was, I was probably drinking too many Pepsis and Pepsi One and all this and that. And I quit stone cold, but then I started drinking sweet teas. Mm -hmm. Sweet teas yeah. from Quick Trip, sweet teas from McDonald's. And all of a sudden, I'm drinking way too much sugar. <laughs> so I cut it to half cuts. Well, I've finally gotten away from it. Now, I will occasionally have, have a Pepsi now from time to time, but I, I've really tried to stay away from that. All right, so in terms of vehicles, Ford, Chevy, or something else, what's your favorite car? Oh, Chevrolet. Now, I say that, I grew up and our family was General Motors. And uh, my dad drove Chevys. My dad also taught driver's ed at Jameson. And he would have those cars that had the brake and the clutch. <laughs> What's a clutch? Uh, <laughs> he would have the driver's ed car. And a lot of times that was our car. The, the, that's what he was driving. And they had a, a, a deal with the Chevrolet dealership in, in Gallatin. Years later, I marry Ann Pearl. Pearl Motor Company in Mexico, Missouri, is Chevrolet. So you couldn't even say the word Ford in their house <laughs> or Chrysler or Dodge or, you know, whatever. It, it had to be 
um, a General Motors product, but it was, it was, I grew up, it was Chevrolet. Uh, my first car in college was a 1964 white, red interior Biscayne. It had no air conditioning. It had no <laughs> radio. Uh, my dad had uh, purchased it from Mr. Somerville in, uh, in Jameson, ran a hardware store, and he bought a brand new one every year, brand spanking new, and it had nothing on it. Didn't even have white walls. It had black walls, <laughs> but it was new, and I got to drive it. And then my my senior year, I talked to my parents. I knew they were going to get me a car for graduation, and I got a 1967 fully loaded Chevrolet Caprice coupe. So uh, I was kind of spoiled that way. But I, you know, we've had different cars at, at different times. Uh, uh, but car of choice early on in my life was Chevrolet. Okay, question number five. You're almost halfway through. Ice cream or cake? Probably cake. And I'll, I'll tell you a story. I, uh, growing up, I mentioned all the aunts and uncles I had, you know, you know my dads and, and uh, moms, brothers and sisters. So I had this one aunt that her famous, wh what she was really good at was banana cake. And I loved it. And she knew I loved it. So every time I would come home from college and she knew I was going to visit her, she would give me a banana cake to bring back to William Jewell to my fraternity brothers or in the dorm, depending on what year I was. Well, I got on the wrong side of Aunt Willa May because here's what I did. Because I had five aunts who lived in coffee seven miles north of Jameson. So I would come home to Jameson uh, maybe Saturday after a game, get up, go to church. And if I went to coffee to visit one of my aunts, I had to visit all five of them. Now... Two of them were sisters of my dad's, and three of them were sisters of my mom's. So I would start out at Aunt Della's on the west side of Coffee, and I'd go visit Aunt Della. And then I would go to Aunt Georgia in town, and then I would go to Aunt Clara in town. And then I'd go to the east side of, of, of uh, Coffee to a farmhouse to see Aunt Helen on my dad's side. Aunt Willa May was the fifth, and I'd go see Aunt Willa May. On this particular Sunday, it was my senior year, I was the president of Lambda Chi Alpha, my fraternity. And I had a fraternity meeting scheduled at seven o'clock or eight o'clock on a Sunday night. And so I get up, go to church, go to coffee, start have family dinner, then start visiting all my aunts. And I got to Aunt Helen's and it was almost seven it was it was almost five thirty, quarter six, and it was about a sixty from there it was about a seventy, seventy five mile trip. And I had to leave. I didn't get to Aunt Willa Mays. I got to Aunt Della's, Aunt George's, Aunt Claire's, Aunt Helen's. And guess what? The only one that had a cake for me was number <laughs> five, and I didn't get there. She had a cake waiting for me. She did not speak to me for in, in a very nice tone of voice for a while, and she didn't cook me another <laughs> banana cake for a long time because I forgot to go by there. But uh, uh, I'd say cake. Okay, question six. What's one item on your bucket list? Um, I already did one of them, and I'll, I'll tell you how enjoyable it was. One of the items on my, on my bucket list was to visit every gymnasium I played in growing up in Jameson, and there were 20 of them. 18 of them are nestled up there in north central Missouri. 19 was Pershing Arena at northeast Missouri State, now Truman State. Played two games there in the state tournament my senior year. The 20th was Brewer Fieldhouse, University of Missouri. Played two games there my senior year. I was blessed. We were 33-1. and one. Our only loss being in the semifinals at Brewer Fieldhouse. The other uh, 18 are nestled up there in north-central Missouri. So my wife and I decided to map it out and call all these places to see if I could get into those facilities. And so it took us three days. Now I'm gonna I'm gonna tell you that I'm gonna, I think I can tell you the schools in order that we visited. The first day, we went to Breckenridge, Missouri, Gallatin, Missouri, and Kidder, Missouri, and Winston, Pattonsburg, and Maysville. Went to all six facilities. Our goal was to take a picture at every city limit sign outside the facility, and then at center court. And I had a basketball with me. And, you know, I could hold the basketball at center court or wherever. So the second day, it was Martinsville, New Hampton, North Harrison of Eagleville, Canesville, Ridgeway, Mount Moriah, and Princeton. We went to seven 
facilities my second day. The third day, it was James Sport, Tri-County High School, Gilman City, South Harrison High School at Bethany, Coffee, Jameson. Coffee and Jameson are now combined into Joint Davies. So it, it was interesting. I think, I don't know, I think there may be six of those high schools still being used for high school basketball today. Uh, most of them had wood floors. Four of them had a tile floor, including the one I grew up on. One of them is now was cement, the, the facility at New Hampton, Missouri. We played in a junior high tournament there when I was a seventh grader and an eighth grader. And the building is gone. It's now an outdoor slab of cement that's now an outdoor court. <laughs> uh, one of the facilities had burned to the ground. And the town, Pattonsburg, kept getting flooded. So they moved the town up the hill so it wouldn't get flooded anymore. So I had to drive up the hill to the new town to do the population sign, drive back to an area that just looked like farmland and in a shell of a building because it had burned to the ground. Others had, are used for junior high. The one in Princeton, Missouri is gone. So I didn't get to take a picture outside the facility. And I asked, where would center court be out here? And they said, well, over on that playground right by the merry-go-round right there. So I stood in a play in the middle of a playground and took a court took a picture because that's where center court might have been it was a it was fun uh going back to those places and in some cases players i had played against came to, to the facility because i knew i was gonna, i was going to be there so i got to see some people i played against in those facilities so i would recommend to anybody that can do it and if it's important to you go back and visit every facility you ever played in i played in 25 facilities in college at William Jewell. I don't think I'll get to all those facilities, but that was those were a special three days for me. I don't think I can remember all the facilities I played in high school. It'd take a lot of work to figure all that out, but uh, that's a pretty cool trip, pretty cool trip. Question seven, who is the all-time leading scorer in William Jewell College men's basketball history? Kirk Chastain. I didn't coach him, uh, sadly. He, uh, uh, the leading scorer at William Jewell in 1952 was Bill Spencer, graduate of Raytown High School. The guy that broke his record was Bud Lathrop, who graduated at William Jewell in 1958. The guy who broke his record was Lee Rourke, Raytown South, one of Bud's early players. But the guy that broke Lee Rourke's record was Kirk Chastain, also Raytown High School, and in 1979. Now I doubt that that record will ever be broken. We had some, we had some guys uh, get close uh, but because at the NEI level, you could, you could play more games. Uh, but I'm, I'm pretty sure he's still number one on the list. All right, question eight. What's your favorite hobby today? Favorite hobby today? I play a little tennis, uh, play a little piano. My hobby right now is writing that book, <laughs> trying to spend some time. I, I probably spend too much time in, in front of the TV, but uh, uh, still, still love watching, watching sports. Uh, huge Chiefs fan, huge Royals fan. Uh, yeah, you know, sports still, but uh, in, enjoyed in, enjoyed being around sporting events. But uh, I was, as I was telling them earlier today, uh, I really enjoy sitting down playing the piano. For now, I'm not great, but for my personal enjoyment, it's very relaxing. Yeah, you're starting to take lessons again a little bit, kind of learning, relearning a little bit, and not taking lessons, but. But I, if I ever do the trumpet again, I probably would need to take some lessons there. But uh, I, there's just some things I can still play and have fun with. And tennis is kind of net new since uh, in the last four or five years, correct? Yeah, I had, I had never, I, I took a tennis class in college. Uh, I was, and then three years later, I'm teaching tennis at Central Methodist. And I, I knew enough of the basics to teach it, but I was never a great player. Uh, the summer of 72, my friend Stan Maxey had just gotten out of the Navy. I was still single, and we spent 35 days traveling from Kansas City to San Francisco. That's a chapter in the book. But every day that we could, we played tennis. And that's the most tennis I ever played in my life. And I probably, out of those 35 days, probably played an hour, hour and a half of tennis, uh, 30 of those 35 days. Got better. I'm still not very good, but uh, have fun. Question nine, is it a great day to be a Cardinal? Every day is a great day to be a Cardinal, <laughs> every day. I, I don't know when I started saying that, but uh, uh, it, it's, it's a true statement for me, it is. Now, some days are better than others, some days are more challenging than others, but uh, when, once you've been a William Jewell Cardinal, you know, uh, 
you know, Northwest Missouri State, uh, once a bear cat, always a bear cat. Well, every day is a great day to be a cardinal. I remember seeing that on, started to be on your emails and facsimiles back in the day and hearing that a lot. And uh, it's true. It's absolutely uh, true. It's a great day to be a cardinal for sure. Now, here's the last question, Coach. This one's really, really important. Which player did you enjoy coaching the most? I'm not going to answer that. <laughs> <laughs> I enjoyed coaching Trey Griggs. That's the right answer. There you go. That's it. <laughs> Man, I, it's like uh, I've, I've got some former players that want me to select all-time teams. And so I, I actually sat down, because I coached four decades, uh, 80s, the 90s, the 2000s, and then the, the 10s. And I could write down at least 10 players in each of those decades. And then trying to pick five, let alone trying to pick five out of, you know, out of a decade, trying to put who's your top five players in, in 40 years. And uh, I'd have an easier task probably at Central Methodist or at Northwest Missouri because I was Central for six and Northwest for four. But uh, yeah, it's, it would, uh, I've, I've been blessed. I've been blessed. and I. You know, it's like uh, it's kind of like the Hall of Fame, quite, quite honestly. I'm chair of the Hall of Fame committee here, and, you know, I'm sure there's people uh, that think they're better than people in the Hall of Fame, and they may be correct. That's, you know, that's, that's tough. That's, also, that's tough being a coach. You know, you've got 12 starters sitting there on, the, you know, on your team, and all of a sudden seven of them are having to do something they haven't done, and that, that is an adjustment, and the ones that accept those roles are the ones that are probably successful. Well, in terms of the players that you've coached, I remember one of my favorite memories is coming back for the alumni game every year and, you know, seeing players from the 70s and 80s and, and our team in the, in the 90s, um, you know, out there playing, having fun, trying to shoot and huff and puff up and down the court was always a great time. But so many, so many good players and, and uh, it's just been a great tradition here at William Jewell. Very blessed. And uh, those alumni days were very special, very special. And, uh, and sometimes they got competitive. <laughs> And I had yes, to watch who, who I was pairing up <laughs> against <her. laughs> because uh, tempers would fly every once in a while. But, uh, yeah, it was uh, uh, great memories, you know, with all those folks. And as, as you know, I'm, I'm doing Zoom calls now with former, uh, former teams, and I'm doing Zoom calls with teams I played on. And uh, to see those guys uh, gather again, even though it's on a, on a screen, maybe we can start doing this in person again. But uh, it's, uh, it's, it's, I've, I've been very blessed. Yeah, beyond doubt, no doubt. So we're going to transition to the next chapter, which is a segment to talk about what's what's going on in the next five years, what's on your plate moving forward. You talked a little bit about writing the book. This is actually the second book because you have one book about the history of basketball here uh, at William Jewell College. But now you're writing another book just telling stories about your life. Tell us about that. Yeah, uh, the last four or five years of my coaching career, uh, being the the old guy in the, on the coaching staff, every once in a while a young coach would come in, shut the door, and ask me questions about, about coaching and the challenges they're having, whether it's things they maybe need from an athletic director or president or, you know, they're having problems with a player. How do you handle this situation or what's your recommendation? Well, during that time, I would tell stories. Well, two or three of them would start telling me, Coach, you should write a book. You should write a book. That's a story that that a lot of people would enjoy hearing. And so uh, when I retired, I had a little more time on my hands. And so I sat down and I just started thinking about things that had happened in my life. It's not a coaching theory book. I may write that, I doubt it, but I, I could write a coaching theory class because I, I coached uh, a number of years and I also taught a class, uh, analysis of coaching basketball for a number of years at Central Methodist Northwest and, and at William Jewell for majors. Uh, but this book has, has been really good for me. My, my daughters, a few years ago, gave me a book uh, that has talked about your legacy. And there's questions in there about my life that I hadn't thought about that maybe I hadn't told my daughters about, that they would like to know about my life. Now that I'm writing this book, I would love to have another conversation with my father. I would love to have another conversation about my mother because... I can't fill in the blanks for some of these things. I don't, you know, my dad went, went, one, went through eighth grade, went one week of high school and quit for four years. Goes back as a 19 year old freshman, graduates at the age of 22, gets his undergrad and masters, becomes superintendent of school. It's, it's, it's a story. What did he do during those four years? I know he farmed, yeah. but I'd love to sit down and talk about what, what, you know, what in the world that was like. 
So it's been, uh, it's been good for me. It's brought memories back. I've had to go back and find newspaper articles. Uh, but it's not, I, I, I've kind of made buckets for lack of another, of a, of a, of a term. Uh, one being family, one being Jameson, one being uh, William Jewell as a student athlete, and then everything between Jewell as an athlete and then back to Jewell as a coach. So there's, there's five buckets there. And so I've tried to, I have written 101, 102 stories in the book. Uh, my, my grammar's pretty good. My, my punctuation's pretty good. My mother was an English teacher. It's not perfect. Uh, my wife, Linda, uh, loves helping with books. She's helped with two other books, one a high school friend, one of my coaching friends. Uh, one's published, one's about to be published. So she's working with me on my book. It will take me a half an hour to an hour, maybe a little longer, because I have to go get details, to write a story. She will spend five times that amount of time making it more interesting, not, not, uh, not changing the facts. But she's, she's very witty and great sense of humor. And, uh, you know, and her grammar and punctuation is better than mine. And then there's software that kind of helps you, you know, get, away, get, get rid of all the, if you've read anything I've written, I've got exclamation marks everywhere. <laughs> well, get rid of the exclamation marks, get rid of the LYs, <laughs> you know, the adverbs. And, uh, but it's, it's, uh, it, it's been uh, rewarding. And I've, I've reconnected with some people with my memory bank trying to make sure, because I don't want to put something in there that's not accurate. I used to tell people, uh, these young coaches, how do, you, how do you remember all that stuff? And I said, well, you know, I might not be telling the truth. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> you don't know. I could be making this up. But uh, trying to be very factual and being very fair. And uh, uh, yeah, there's, there's some things I'm not going to have in the book. Uh, but I, I think they're cute stories. And uh, whether it goes beyond much of the audience of William Jewell in Kansas City and North Missouri, I don't know. We've talked to uh, two or three publishers about it. We haven't made a decision, but it's it's been very good for me to do this. Does the book have a title yet? It doesn't. Uh, I, you know, uh, Linda's first thought was how I got here, but the publishers that I've talked to think that the word coaching or basketball needs to be in the title. Uh, I, mean, I kind of like that. Know, That's kind of catchy, how I know, got a, here. A, a, sub, a subtitle would be short stories on a long career. I mean, there's there's different things that, that we've thought about, but uh, have have not settled on a title of it. But uh, um, you'll be one of the first to know. I hope I get a signed <laughs> copy. I'm I'm looking forward to that. We'll work that out. <laughs> we'll work it out. Now you're still involved in the community here in Liberty and still very much a part of the college. How have you balanced, you know, staying involved and and being supportive in the community, but also allowing Coach Chris McCabe, the new coach, to have his space to really develop the program and his vision. Well, I, I didn't want to interfere in any way. And in, in fact, uh, I stayed away, you know, but my first year, obviously most of the, t you know, almost the whole team had been people I had coached and I'd even helped recruit the new players. Now there were a couple of players they got after I had retired. So I pretty much knew everybody, but I purposely stayed away from practices. Um, coach McCabe, and I told, and Coach McCabe understood that, but he invited me to a practice and so I went to a practice, and I'm hugging all the all the players and saying a few words. And then he invited me to uh, there are three uh, uh, scrimmages, and um, and that was unusual. I uh, uh, during the season now we still had fans that year. This was before COVID. I didn't want to sit behind the bench. I was trying to figure out where do I sit. I didn't want to sit on the bench on the baseline next to the bench. I didn't want to sit across from the bench. So I sat across from the visitor's bench down by the concession stand, tried to be on the rail, tried to be sight unseen, and uh, just, just didn't want to interfere. I just, I, I would like to be there. I didn't want to be this distraction in any, any way, shape, or form. But I will tell you a cute story. At least I think it's cute. It's going to be in the book. I hope somebody gets a chuckle out of this. Well, as a coach, Sometimes you have a good relationship with a referee, and sometimes you don't. But you always hope that you respect them and they respect you as a coach, because it, it can be an adversarial relationship. So I go 
there were three scrimmages that first year that Coach McCabe invited me to. And so I go to the first one, and I'm sitting away from everything. I'm, but it's close to the, you know, I mean, there aren't, there's nobody there except me and a, a few others, videotapers and that sort of thing. One of the officials sees me and walks across to where I am. I walk down to the floor. All three officials hug me. Second scrimmage. Same thing happens. One of the referees sees me. They come over there. All three of them give me a hug. Third scrimmage. Three, one of them sees me. All three of them give me a hug. I hadn't gotten nine hugs from officials <laughs> in my entire coaching career. I don't think I had one hug from an official. And I've been to three scrimmages. I think they were all happy I was retired. <laughs> That was, but that was funny, and that'll be, that's a little note note for the book. That was, that was, well, it's funny. They're all coming over, they're all giving me hugs, and they're glad I'm sitting up in the bleachers. <laughs> Not on well, the you're, you're always pretty diplomatic with the officials. I didn't, you know, you never ripped your jacket off and threw it around and that kind of thing. No, so. I didn't do that. I, I had their moment. I, I didn't have many technicals in my career. I, I don't think I had one at all at Harrisburg or Central Methodist. I, re, I remember my first one at, uh, when I was coaching at Central Missouri against my good friend Tom Smith, uh, I'm the head coach. My first year as head coach at Northwest Missouri State, and uh, we're at Northwest. Uh, we're at Central Missouri, and we're up. It's it's midway through the the first half, and we're playing pretty well. And Tom Smith, the coach at Central Missouri, calls timeout, and he goes out to the officials and he's pointing up there at the scoreboard on the number of fouls. And I, there were seven fouls on Central Missouri and two fouls on Northwest Missouri State. I thought that was very appropriate. <laughs> but he's out there letting the officials have it. Five minutes later, Central Missouri still has seven fouls. Northwest Missouri State has nine. <laughs> I learned very quickly I had to fend for myself in the MIAA. Those, those coaches were getting after it a little bit more than the guys I'd, I'd faced in, in the MC, old MCAU and Heart of America when I was at Central Methodist. But uh, uh, no, it, it's, uh, it, it, it was an adjustment for me. I didn't want to be the distraction. Uh, Coach McCabe has been very generous with, with his words and uh, allowing me to you know, be around. Uh, again, I don't want to interfere. His assistant, Christian Hildebrandt, had a great senior year for us. And uh, so I got to coach him. And then he was my last year. He was my, my our for our, full-time assistant and delightful young man, outstanding young coach. And so I'm glad he's still on staff with Coach McCabe and uh, he's, he's doing a great job. Okay, so outside of writing the books and being a grandpa, a great grandpa, what else are you trying to accomplish in the next, you know, five to 10 years here in retirement? Trying to stay healthy. Uh, you know, I was just getting used to being retired when this COVID hit. And, uh, and so I, I'm finding it really challenging to go without a mask quite honestly, because uh, we've been very, very careful. We, neither one got COVID. We both had our shots and hope to stay that way. But uh, the, last, the last week or so, I've walked into places and nobody has a mask on. It just, and I've, I've got one in my pocket. So this morning, because we were having you folks over, I decided to stop at Lamar's, uh, which I hadn't been in forever. I've gotten away from that. that uh, it was a great habit. <laughs> but probably not, not a healthy habit. And so I walk, walk in without a mask on. I walk in and everybody has a mask on. I looked on the door and it said, uh, uh, please consider using your mask. I can't remember exactly. It didn't require it, but it was clear that they wanted you to wear a mask. So I walked back out to my car and got a mask and went back, went back, went back in. But, uh, uh I, you know, I just, I, I hope to stay healthy. I hope uh, uh, I'm able to finish the book. I uh, uh, hope to be able to enjoy grandkids. Uh, two of my grandchildren will be in the basketball camp here at William Jewell this summer. Uh, I won't be directing the camps, but uh, Coach uh, uh, Slaminski and Coach McCabe have been very gracious to invite me to be a part of it. I, I don't know if I'll do it beyond this year, but, uh, you know, those camps are, were always fun for me because I could hire people to come back and coach that I didn't see for a while and former players such as you to come back and work <laughs> at camps uh, for the high salary that we paid that's you right right and the t-shirt high quality got. referees that's out there a, <laughs> that's any referees so you know I just hope to stay healthy and, and busy and continue to play some tennis and 
maybe uh, start playing a little more pickleball again and, and uh, just just enjoying life and enjoying the, the people that, uh, I mean, these Zoom calls have been amazing uh, to see people who I've got a player in Turkey, I've got a player in Finland, I've got a player in Holland, and all of a sudden I'm on a Zoom call with them and their teammates. And uh, to watch those guys connect again after maybe haven't seen any, seen everybody for a while, we may have to do the 97. I hope we do. I, that would be a pleasure to see uh, see those guys that you know we went to battle together and absolutely great memories. And it's like they never left. Forever. You know, yeah. they're back in the locker room, telling uh, Coach Holly his two foul rule sucks. <laughs> <laughs> Shirt tails in. <laughs> well, Coach, I'm sure a lot of people would be interested in reading the book when it comes out. What's the best way for people to stay in touch with you and get a hold of you? Well, they can email me. Uh, I'm, I'm happy to send them my, my cell number if they'd like to text, uh, you know, whatever, whatever works for everybody. The, uh, my, uh, you want me to give my email Absolutely, address? Absolutely, yeah. Go my ahead. email address is, uh, is like it was at, at Williamsville College. It's Holly L, H-O-L-L-E-Y-L at William.Jewel.edu. And remember that Jewel has two L's on it. That's right. And you got a Twitter account, Holly underscore coach. Uh, uh, that's, I'm not that's using that well, very not much. too much, I'm, but uh, yeah. but if they want to see shirt tails in, it's right there on the, in the description. <laughs> I saw that uh, this week as we prepared. Coach, thank you so much for being on the podcast. It's been such a pleasure to spend time with you and with Linda and think back through some incredible memories. And just thank you for all that you've done for me. Well, thank you and congratulations on your success with your company. And it's it's this has been a pleasure going down memory lane with you. Thank you so much. Well, thank you for joining us for another episode of Bathrooms and Bunkers, powered by Lean Solutions Group. And remember, excellence is in you, so let it out.